Well, excited to be joined now on Mass and All Access by Assistant General Manager Sig Mandel. Sig, thanks so much for taking the time during a, a very busy week for you. Here. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Brendan. Happy to be here. So I want to talk kind of generally to start about the growth of analytics in the draft process. Can you talk about maybe your time in, in St. Louis, in Houston, when that process was just getting fired up, yeah. where it's more commonplace now? Yeah, it was a different time back then. 2005 in St. Louis, I started. Um, I was the fourth analyst in baseball, so that means that 26 teams thought the perfect number were zero. And so they simply didn't have persons that they were deploying towards the draft analytics. And so it was in its early stages, but that was the bad news. But the good news was you had very little competition. Yeah, so you were ahead of the game at that point. Now there's 29 other teams in Major League Baseball that are using analytics, at least to some extent, in yeah. their draft process. How are you guys trying to make sure that you are always one step ahead of the game? Yeah, like in the industry, I think as time goes on, the inefficiencies get harder to find. They're smaller and they last for a shorter amount of time. So it's still our job is to, to find out edge and to take advantage of it. So I miss the good old days when there was much less competition, but it's, it's still a challenge and the marching orders are, are still the same. Yeah, and that's how you get the innovation there, right, from the competition. I want to talk, too, about you know, the balance of the analytics versus the traditional scouting. And then, of course, you're trying to balance the player development staff there as well. How do you find that balance and cohesion with all those different departments? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's, it's mandatory. I, I think, and others may not, but I think of the draft as an exercise in combining information. And if that information has predictive ability, you better be taking advantage of it. So after we squeeze all we can out of the numbers, the scouts' prognostications add a tremendous amount and vice versa. So if we're going into this draft competition, like you need to be well-loaded, well-prepared in, in both areas. And it's just, it's like going to a fight with one hand tied behind your back if you, if you aren't locked up both in the analytics and the scouting world. And an important part of that as well is the player development staff of your coaches down at the minor league level, because not only are you trying to find a player that you know meets all of your qualifications for somebody that you want to draft, but you're also trying to find somebody who you believe your player development staff, your coaches down at the minor league level, are going to be able to coach up and develop, right? Yeah, I just came from a meeting and uh, we had quite a few player development personnel there, and they're evaluating the potential draftees they're making sense of a lot of the, the combine information. And yeah, we'd be foolish not to take advantage of their expertise. And when the scouts come, when they arrive tomorrow, there's gonna to be a lot of feedback too on how the players that we've drafted are doing and how it jibes or disagrees a little bit with the prognostication. So giving that feedback is, is the only way we, I know how to, to develop expertise. And so we take advantage of that. Now, you mentioned the scouts coming back. Can you talk about the, the few-day crunch there where every scout is in the room, everybody's in the room, you're trying to come to that uh, cohesive decision there? Yeah, this is the fun part. And it's never going to be a cohesive decision. I think right. you're trying to minimize the group's unhappiness uh, that, that different scouts and different methodologies will point in different directions on the same player. So we're doing the best we can to make sense of this information. So... Uh, We've been spending, well, the in entire year, but especially the last couple of weeks, uh, putting the players in our order. And um, when, the, when the scouts come, there'll be more discussions and more movements. But I, I think we have a fairly well-anchored list now. But um, there'll be, like I said, plenty of discussions and plenty of disagreements coming up. And speaking of that list, I want to touch on this draft class specifically a little bit. We know the value, and especially for you guys here, over the last few years has been up the middle with catchers, shortstops, center fielders, <laughs> and then on the mound as well when looking at, at starting pitching prospects. Can you talk about this draft and where you think the strengths lie up the middle here? It seems like a pretty talented draft class. Yeah. You know, it's another year of, of all the thousands of players that are playing baseball that hope to get drafted. So it's, it's so unlikely that of these thousand players, you're going to have this noticeable preponderance of, of shortstops or catchers. It's usually the case of, of somebody looking at the first half dozen players and noticing there's, 
three catchers or something. So um, other than the very top, uh, which we're not drafting at, I sort of think of it as another draft class of the best shortstops, best left fielders, best starting pitchers in the country making themselves available for a Pro Bowl. Right, and the strength of the draft class doesn't really matter as long as you can find your guy within that strength. In the middle of this draft here, there are a lot of talented high schoolers. We know that the technology has grown over the past few seasons. And of course, dating back to your time when you were one of the only analysts in baseball in St. Louis, how much easier has it become to draft high schoolers with confidence? Yeah, you're, you bring up a good point. There's a lot more now that an analyst could sink their teeth into. There's um, beyond the high school statistics, which are, are, are a challenge to make sense of, the players have often been playing in tournaments with other of the best high school players in the country. We'll have track man data on them, both the pitchers and the hitters. There's a Major League Baseball combine, so we're getting a lot of physiological measurements too. So there's a lot more to make sense of. And because of that, there's a lot more confidence we have to, to, um, to bet on a high school player. And as you mentioned before, too, the Orioles are not at the top of this draft. You're down at number 17. What are some of the challenges that come with drafting a little bit later in the first round? It's wonderful because we're at 17. <laughs> that means we had a good season. So right. I hope uh, we draft later and later every year. Uh, the challenges are, are the same. Um, it's, it's really an exercise in putting these players in order and as best you can, and then the dynamics of the draft sort of determine which ones you actually get. Uh, I'd rather in some ways be drafting at the top, but I know that that, what that means about our last season. So where we are is, is wonderful, and I hope it's later and later. Now you guys have gone in the direction of position players in the last few drafts in the first round. Can you talk about some of the challenges of evaluating a first-round pitcher, some of the risks that may come with selecting a pitcher that high in the draft? Yeah. As you speak of, we've ended up with a lot uh, more hitters in the early rounds, but there's no master plan for us to uh, sidestep pitchers in the early rounds. A lot of that is just happenstance. If you, if you were in the draft room, you would have seen us uh, lose pitchers here and there just because of the team in front of us or two or three in front of us. So the pitchers are like, like any other player. Um, they're going to produce runs. They're going to produce runs at the major league level. And we're just trying to amass the best production, whether it comes from a left fielder, a shortstop, a closer, a starting pitcher. The scoreboard doesn't care. And, and, f and for the most part, we don't care either. So contrary to popular belief, there's not a master plan to not draft pitchers in the first round. Correct. <laughs> so as you mentioned, the Orioles are, are winning games at the big league level. You're not up at the top of the draft. But does the success in the big leagues change your draft strategy at all outside of where you're selecting in the first round? Is there any more sense of urgency to say, hey, this guy might line up with our timetable of winning right now? How does that impact your draft plan, if at all? Yeah, none whatsoever. I mean, you, even if it's a college guy, a mature college guy, he's still three, four, five, six years away from making his debut. So good luck knowing what your major league needs are right. at that time. So unless maybe you've signed like a young Albert Pujols in the National League without a DH, you might want to steer away from first baseman, where again, it's, it's sort of boring. We're looking for the best player, the most productive player, regardless of... of what position it is, and what we happen to currently have in the major leagues. And finally, I know that past success in the draft doesn't mean that you get complacent, but in a week like this leading up to the draft, how much confidence does it give you that the formula, so to speak, that you guys have had over the last few years is working and it's giving you successful players here? Yeah, undoubtedly, it's, it's wonderful that the players we drafted are doing well for the Baltimore Orioles. But I mean, we model thousands of players and yeah, we always have that insecurity that something has changed, our model's missing something. And so we're looking for the feedback, the early returns as quickly as possible. But it's not just 1 30th of the players that we happen to get, it's, it's the whole pot of players. So there definitely is this desire to have the best model uh, available the best model we could create and to have 
it be able to adjust as quickly as it can as baseball changes. Well, given some of the major league debuts that we have seen and the success in the minor leagues, it seems like that model has really worked well here over the last few years. But Assistant General Manager Sig Meidel, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.